Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this senior college class on the overview of county government. Um, senior college has offered quite a variety of classes this semester, or this term, I should say. And um, but this one is a pretty unique one. It's about about us. You know, when we think of government, we think of the federal government or the state government, but but there's also a whole structure that pertains right to the county, the county that we live in. And so uh, tonight we have Ryan Pelsey, who has um, been involved in government ever since I've known him. And that's from the university days, uh, student government and uh, went on to be town manager um, in, in several communities. The last one being Madawaska also has uh, two degrees from the University of Maine at Fort Kent and one from the University of Southern Maine. A uh, whole uh, array yeah. of certificates <laughs> as well. So clearly Ryan has been in government all his life and, uh, and knows a lot about it. And so tonight uh, he is going to be sharing some information about our Rustic County government. So Ryan, please thank you for doing this class. It's uh, we're looking forward to it actually. Thank you, uh, Don. I and it's great to see everybody. I I know everybody. Uh, I think on the uh, on the Zoom tonight. A uh, little bit of history. Uh, my second town was the town that I live in now, Saint Agat. And back then, does anybody know who the chairman of the board of the uh, board of selectmen of Saint Agatha was when I was hired? Uh, was it Diane? Diane Castonga. <laughs> <laughs> Notice hey, she did. She didn't admit it. She didn't admit it. No. <laughs> just moved it on. That was a long time ago. That was 1999, and I had ah. I had been the town manager of Wallagrass for about a year before that. Okay. So. Yeah, I remember that. And then I ended up staying in St. Agatha for quite a few years and then left for a little while, went into, went to work for Northern Maine Development. And then I really missed being in local government. So I came back to Madawaska when that opportunity was there and thought I was going to stay for a few more years. But then this position opened up uh, kind of unexpectedly. Um, my predecessor, Doug Bollier, decided to retire early and that uh, opened up this position. And, and so I've been here with the county now for um, almost five years. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> oh, now, Don, it's not letting me advance. What am I doing wrong? Oh, um, oh there we go. Okay, I guess I got to do it by hit, hitting the pad. Okay, no problem. Um, so, yeah, Don really kind of kicked this off well with talking about the fact that county government is uh, is oftentimes forgot about. It's um, it's not a it's not a level of government that gets a lot of notoriety usually. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we're also um, fixated on our own local town government and what's happening in our own communities. And then we hear a lot about what's happening at the state um, or federal level, but the county government kind of goes under the radar. And in some ways that's good. And in some ways we'd, we'd like to see some of that changed. Um, there's only been three people that have held uh, the position that I hold now, I'm uh, being the third one. And both my predecessors, uh, Doug Bullier and Danny Martin, both told me um, this is the greatest job they both had. So I kind of felt good getting the position when I did because I thought it was going to be this great position. But sometimes as, as things evolved, um, there has been some recent things that have happened where county government nationally has gone in the spotlight because in other parts of the country, county government really operates very differently than it does here in Maine. And sometimes we get drug into that, even though we don't provide the same services that other states do. Um, you know, New England is traditional town meeting, local government, form of government. You get further to the southeast and then out west, a lot of the services that you're used to being provided uh, at the local level are actually provided by your county government. Having said that, in Maine, county government is actually the oldest form of government. And the reason for that is because um, county government was actually established when Massachusetts, we were still part of Massachusetts, and so York County is actually older uh, than the state of Maine. And there was a whole elected structure of government there in York County when Maine became a state in 1820. Um, it's the only form of um, 
regional government where officials are directly elected by the voters. Um, and then in Maine, as we know, there are 16 counties and traditionally it's always been a three person board of commissioners. A couple of the counties have since changed that structure and now they elect five or seven commissioners. Uh, same principle, they're divided by districts and they each serve uh, about the same population. So the commissioners are my bosses. They're, they're like the elected town council or board of selectmen that hires the uh, public administrator to run the day-to-day -day affairs. Um, and ultimately, those commissioners are the ones that are responsible for the fiscal operations, setting policy, uh, you know, making decisions that I then have to carry out as the, as the county manager or the county um, uh, administrator. Some other things that we're responsible for that you don't often think about is we hear municipal tax abatement appeals. So if a local citizen is uh, upset with their local tax assessment by their board of selectmen, and they apply for an abatement and that abatement is denied, they can take that to the next level, which is the board of commissioners who then would hold a session and, and hear from both sides and make a determination if the uh, assessed value is fair and just. And there's also a portion of the law that allows the commissioners to intercede when a uh, resident actually need three residents to sign a petition um, and file basically a petition claiming that their road, their town way or their public road is in such disrepair that it's dangerous. You got to remember some of these laws were made at the time when motor vehicles weren't even <laughs> invented. So there, it's a very high threshold to convince the board of commissioners today that the road is not passable. Uh, this was done during the days of horse and buggy, quite frankly. Um, but if you, I've looked back at old minutes and old records and commissioners have actually come out into some of the most rural parts of our county back in the 1920s and 1930s and have, um, you know, made determinations on whether or not a road was passable or not or safe to be on at certain times of the year. Um, the commissioners are elected to three, uh, or excuse me, are elected to four year terms. They do represent the geographic region. Uh, that is decided every 10 years during the census. It's laid out. We've just gone through that process and it's, it's based on uh, population. So we try to keep the population of each district relatively the same. Um, so in our case, we have a commissioner that represents Southern Aroostook, one in Central Aroostook and one that represents the Northern part of the county, mostly the St. John Valley, but some of the towns in what we would consider North Central, like New Sweden, Stockholm, Parham, they fall in the same district as the St. John Valley. Um, as I said earlier, they, they set policy, they approve all policies that we have. They do appoint the county administrator. A um, Little different between county government and local government. In a town manager form of government, I had the authority to appoint all officials um, except for department heads. Usually the board of selectmen or town council confirms department heads, but any of the other positions, you know, an employee in the rec department or janitor or what have you, uh, I could appoint those without approval by the board. In county government, it's very different. Every single employee, it doesn't matter what you do in county government, has to be brought forward and confirmed by the, um, by the commissioners. Um, they have the authority to create and abolish advisory boards and they participate in the budget process. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our budget process in another slide, but in Aroostook County, um, Aroostook County adopted a charter in the mid 1980s, and it gave a lot of authority to an elected finance committee that is separate and independent from the board of commissioners and has actually a little more authority in the budget process than the commissioners themselves do. And of course, any other uh, duties that are found in the charter or law would fall under the commissioners. So again, here's a, just a, a graphic. You have the voters of Aroostook County and you go out every four years and you, on your ballot, um, you elect commissioners. They have to run, take out nomination papers and file those papers with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, and then the Secretary of State puts those ballots out. So when you're voting, like you, we were talking about the referendum ballot that you're going to be voting on in a couple of weeks, same ballot uh, when the commissioner is up for election is printed on a state ballot and uh, assigned to the appropriate town. So up in the St. John Valley, Norm uh, Fournier uh, would be on the ballot for the Northern region. At the same time, Paul Underwood, you wouldn't see his name in the Valley. You'd see his name on a ballot in uh, Presque Isle Caribou area. And when commissioner Adams is up, uh, same thing in, in the Holton area. 
again, this is what I call the um, elected half of the house. And, and so where county government is very different than, than local government is in addition to the elected commissioners, and I mentioned the finance committee members, actual department heads are also elected. Uh, makes my job very interesting when you have a department head that you really don't have any true authority over. You have to get along with them because they don't answer to me. They answer to the people. Uh, I'm very fortunate that all, um, all department heads that we have are we're very, we get along very well. Um, probably the two most prominent department head elected officials is the sheriff and the district attorney. The difference between the district attorney and other county employees is in the 1970s to try to bring parity across the state, they eliminated what was then called the county attorney, basically the same job prosecuting crime, and they created prosecutorial districts. And so they went from 16 county attorneys down to eight prosecutorial districts. A rustic because of our size and geography, um, we, nothing changed for us except for the title. Uh, we're still the same, Aroostook County is its own prosecutorial district. But in other counties, other counties share the district attorney. So like in Washington County, they share that position with Hancock County. In the coastal region, there's one area, I think it's the Knox, Lincoln, Waldo, they share one district attorney. And when that person is elected, and even though they're elected by the county, they automatically become a state employee, um, unlike the sheriff who remains a county employee and the other elected officials. In the sheriff's department, uh, there is a chief deputy. That chief deputy is appointed and swears to the sheriff only. He does not or she does not need to be confirmed by the commissioners. It's the only position in county government that does not need approval by the commissioners. That is the sheriff's decision only to uh, appoint uh, his or her chief deputy. But all the other employees that work underneath the chief deputy and the sheriff um, are are appointed by, or confirmed rather, by the, by the, the board. Uh, current sheriff has uh, two divisions, a law enforcement division. That's your patrol folks. So deputies out on the road patrolling um, in their cruisers. Those are, those are the law enforcement division. Also part of that division is our dispatch. We have um, six full-time and three part-time dispatchers who dispatch all emergency calls for the sheriff's office, but also many, many of our towns. We have towns that Madawaska would be the largest one that we have. They don't have any dispatchers on staff in Madawaska. They contract that through us. And so when there's a 911 call that comes in for that town, our dispatch will dispatch either the Madawaska Fire Department, ambulance, or their local PD. We have about 14 or 15 towns that use that service for a fee. It's outside of the county tax. It's a, it's a contractual agreement. Um, and we also do some private ambulance services in central and southern Aroostook as well as the, as the municipalities. The other division in the sheriff's office is your corrections division. That is the jail. Um, it, this one slide here is the, where the majority of the employees that work for the county reside. Um, the jail has about 35 employees that, uh, that work there 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, there is one uh, captain in the jail and then 29 full-time employees. And then you have your transport and support division which with a supervisor and five full-time and four part-time. Transport division is, um, is the folks that actually move prisoners around. Uh, if a prisoner is in jail and needs to go to court, we provide that transportation. If they need to go to the hospital, uh, if they have a uh, mental health uh, appointment, anything at all that you can think of that you would drive yourself to, by law, the county has to provide that transportation to our inmate population. Um, on, the on the district attorney's side, uh, there are some legal assistants. Right now, there are four. I, I believe we're going to be getting another one. Those are all state employees, so we don't really get involved in the hiring or firing of those people. Uh, but those assistant district attorneys um, are also appointed, and they work for uh, the district attorney. But again, they're state employees. So what does the county have to do for the district attorney's office? We have to provide all the staff support. And that's where you see this slide here of your legal assistants and your advocates. Um, those are paralegals, legal secretaries, 
the advocates are your victim witness advocates, folks that um, work with people that are victims of domestic violence or sexual assault, anything like that. Uh, we're, we're obligated to provide that staff. We're also obligated to provide the office, you know, so anything that costs the district attorney money, uh, travel, training, uh, meetings, all of those ancillary expenses, the county pays for. <clears throat> Other elected positions that sometimes aren't thought about as prevalent, um, registry of deeds. So in Fort Kent, you're familiar with the registry of deeds north building that's up by uh, Al's and, and the Skeeto. Uh, that position is elected. Um, there is a deputy registrar of deeds that works there as well. That person is appointed. And then we have a part-time deeds associate position that isn't filled right now. Uh, and that person does um, um, imaging and scanning to put records online for us. In the Southern Registry, uh, and by the way, we're the only county left that actually has two registry of deeds. All other counties have, uh, most of them already only had one. There was other counties that had two before and, and they've consolidated. Uh, many years ago, our state legislature, uh, our delegation, I appear, um, codified the Registry of Deeds North in statute. So it's a little more difficult for uh, us to ever, it would be difficult for anybody to try to take away the Registry of Deeds building in the North uh, because it is in statute that there will be a Registry of Deeds North and it's actually stated in the law that it will be located in Fort Kent. Um, same thing in Holton, though, the Registry of Deeds has a deputy and a deeds clerk that files instruments and, and does recordings down there. There is a county treasurer that is elected. Uh, that's a very part-time position because we have staff now that uh, manages most of the funds for the county and you know, pays the bills and payroll and those sorts of things. But there is an elected county treasurer. Um, about a year into my job, I tried to get rid of that and put it on the ballot as a referendum question to eliminate the elected county treasurer. And we would have just appointed a staff person to that role, just like most towns have done. And that was resoundedly defeated at the polls, uh, two to one <laughs> vote. So taught me a lesson that you can't just put something on and think uh, you're going to get your way. <laughs> um, other positions that are elected, uh, the probate office. Uh, so there's a judge of probate who hears all probate cases. That's more of a part-time position. He holds court maybe uh, twice a month and he rotates in different parts. Uh, during the last year and a half, he's been doing a lot of these cases by Zoom whenever possible. And then there's a registrar probate and a deputy registrar and a probate clerk who does a lot of the filings and uh, manages the day-to-day -day affairs of the probate office. Probate office is located in Holton as well. Um, but uh, but they rotate their court sessions around <clears throat> outside of obviously COVID whenever they can hold meetings in person. Trying to get it to go. There we go. So that was the elected side. And so then the other half of county government is the appointed um, folks. I'm appointed. I have an assistant who's appointed. And then these uh, five other divisions, departments are all appointed folks. So our emergency management agency, that's an appointed director. We have a human resources director, um, community services director. Some of you know Paul Bernier, that's his, his job. He oversees all the unorganized territories. We have a facilities and IT director that basically manages all of the buildings in, count, in the county that we own, the courthouses, the registry of deeds buildings, the sheriff's office, those types of buildings. He's also the IT director, so he oversees our entire network. That's Brian Jondro, for those of you in Fort Kent, uh, might know Brian. He's been with the county for, I think, almost 40 years. Um, and then our finance director is also appointed. And then you see the different staff that work for them. Um, either uh, in EMA, they have a planning department. So they have a planning associate, an assistant planner, deputy director, and public safety coordinator. Um, our EMA office also is the staff to the North Lakes Fire Department, which is based in Cross Lake, Sinclair, and Madawaska Lake. So their staff also serves as overseeing that fire department. So we have 42 on-call volunteer firefighters um, that respond to fires in that, what we call the North Lakes region. The unorganized territory, besides Paul, does not have any staff per se most of everything we do is contracted. So we contract with either neighboring municipalities, 
if we can, and if we can't, we contract with the private sector for road maintenance, paving, uh, ditching, snow removal, you name it. <clears throat> um, and then finance has a payroll and an AP person who processes the payroll and accounts payable. Um, and the superintendent of buildings works for Brian and he oversees the maintenance and custodians. All of those people are in Holton. That's where the majority of, uh, no, excuse me, I take that back. There's a full-time custodian in Caribou. Brian uh, does that kind of work, the custodial work up in the Fort Kent office because it's so small that we don't have another person there doing that work. <clears throat> what do I do? Um, I'm responsible for the administration of these departments and any of the offices that are controlled by the county commissioners. Like I said earlier, I can't tell the elected department heads like the sheriffs or the registrars or the judge of probate um, what to do or what I think they should do. So it's a balancing act of trying to work with them diplomatically whenever there are issues that arise. And uh, the one thing that the charter did do is it gives total control of the finances into the county administrator's office. So I can hold the line on what they want to spend money on, uh, but I can't tell them what to do with their budget after it's been approved by the finance committee. Um, so it's a, um, it's a, um, it's always a work in progress trying to keep everybody happy, both the elected officials and the appointed officials and the county commissioners. Uh, it's just the way, it, it's the way it's structured. It's the way it works. Um, my job also includes being the clerk and purchasing agent for all county departments. So I don't physically, you know, do all of the purchasing, obviously, but ultimately all of the bills that are generated by the county departments come through the office that I work in and are paid for out of that office. <clears throat> and like any public administrator, all other duties as prescribed by policy, charter, or statute, and uh, my contract is is bound by the commissioners. And um, I try to get a four-year contract at a time. And so while I'm under contract, basically, uh, you know, I I'm theirs. <laughs> and so anything they need me to do or want me to do, I I do it. <clears throat> We do have a human resources director, like I said, uh, that falls under the administration. Um, she really works a lot with all of our employees dealing with uh, recruitment, personnel records. She's a big part of any labor relations. We have two uh, unions uh, in the county. We have a, a union for the jail employees and there's a union for the law enforcement, uh, the deputies. So we do collective bargaining. Um, she is part of that team. So she manages that. Um, all in-house training, sexual harassment, OSHA stuff, whatever, she oversees that. Um, and she right now is a one-person de department. We have put in, and it looks like it's going to be approved to bring on a, an assistant for uh, her department uh, next year. Uh, she's been with the county for 20 years, almost 20 years. Um, and when she was hired 20 years ago, the county had about 60 employees. And as you can see over the years, County has grown. We have 92 full-time, uh, six part-time, and you can't, um, I don't know if you, you can see it on your slide, but it's um, quite a few on-call employees that we have. That Most of those are in the fire department. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the treasurer in the finance department. Um, they work really hand-in-hand. -hand. The, the treasurer, like I said, is I don't want to say a figurehead, but, you know, the person, it's truly a part-time position. He's paid a stipend of like $5,000 a year, uh, basically to come in and evaluate the, the finances and make sure that we're doing our job separate from an independent auditor that also obviously audits our books. Uh, so the day-to-day -day operations of the treasurer's office is really handled by our finance director. Um, and these are the things that are responsible for. These come right from the statute. Uh, manage all the funds received, whether they're from taxes or fees or contracts. Um, county government gets its revenue from the municipality. So when you receive your tax bill, there's a portion of that that is for the county services. It's usually about 5% of your taxes uh, are going to fund county government. That can be a little higher, a little less, depending on your community and what their budget is, but on average, it's about 5% of the total. So when the Board of Selectmen or the Town Council commits their taxes um, and, and sends out their bills, they're adding in the, the county tax bill, just like they're adding in the cost for education. Um, <clears throat> the Finance Department provides receipts and payment uh, reports on, we do a quarter, we do 
We do internally, we do monthly uh, financial reports, but we provide quarterly financials to the commissioners. So every quarter we do a presentation to the commissioners meeting. So there's a public process to let people know what we're spending on, um, what we're what we're saving on, where our revenue is coming from. <clears throat> and then we have uh, an annual financial report that gets distributed to the citizens. And we do that through charter, requires us to send a copy of our financial report to every municipality uh, in the county. And we pl- uh, post it on our, face- um, on our Facebook, on our website. Um, and we hold a public hearing that we publish in all local newspapers in the county, letting people know when our public hearing is on our budget. It's coming right up. It's going to be on November 16. Um, so anybody from the municipalities um, or citizens can come in and, uh, and criticize or comment on our budget. <clears throat> I mentioned the finance committee. This is pretty unique to county government. Um, and I wasn't here, obviously, in the mid-1980s when this was, I was here, but I obviously wasn't working. I was probably like in, I was like 10 years old. <laughs> um, but they, <clears throat> for some reason, for whatever reason, um, there was some turmoil. And um, the budget committee that was there at the time and the commissioners that were at the time really saw a need to try to professionalize and make, make county government more accountable. Um, and so they did that through the presentation and adoption of a charter. Aroostook was the first county in Maine to adopt a charter. And the charter spells out what my job is, what the commissioner's job is, um, what the finance committee that was going to be brought on is, and it really gave a lot of authority to that finance committee. There are nine people and they are elected and that's very unique. Usually budget committees are appointed by the board. In Rustic's case, that finance committee takes out nomination papers and they run for their position just like the commissioners do. They're divided into sub areas of each commissioner's district. So in the St. John Valley in that Northern district, there are actually three areas that um, comprise the uh, commissioners, uh, the finance committee areas. Um, the makeup's going to change because of the census, but right now the three are uh, Nelson Jondro from Madawaska. He represents one area. Uh, Michelle Raymond from Eagle Lake. She represents another area. She's brand new. Uh, her father, Reynold, was the member of the finance committee for years, and he resigned, and she ended up getting his position. Um, and then the third one is actually in that more of that central area of the county that is still part of the district. It's uh, Moore Farms. I don't know if you're familiar with Moore Farms on the way into Caribou. Scott Moore lives in uh, uh, Woodland, and that falls in that district. He's the third one. And then there are three others in the central uh, district and three in southern. So they're elected, and, and they, you know, they meet uh, right now. This is when we're meeting. We're actually having a, our what we call our big finance committee meeting on Friday. And that's where the budget's going to be presented to them formally. They're going to go through it. They're going to make changes, suggestions, revisions, whatever. And then we go to that public hearing that I mentioned earlier. Um, And this is, and I don't think I've ever, I don't think it's ever happened, but if for any reason the commit, the finance committee says, this is what the budget is and the commissioners um, change it. It's sent back to the finance committee and the finance committee can reject the changes of the commissioners by a two thirds vote. And if that happens, that is the final budget that's going out there. It's not the commissioner's budget. It's the finance committee's budget that has final say. So it's not as easy. It's, it's a very high threshold. It's like I said, it, by the time we usually get to the finance committee, we've whittled that budget down far enough that we know they're not going to do anything to it, but it can happen. And, and they have more authority in our charter than the commissioners do. Um, I'm going to go through each slide here rather quickly because I don't want to take up too much of your time, but each department or each elected official does have, um, you know, responsibilities. Like I said, the DA is the top prosecutorial um, officer of the county. Basically, if someone commits a crime, it's up to the DA to determine, you know, if that person can be brought to trial um, and prosecuted prosecuted doesn't mean found guilty. It means there's enough evidence that they're going to bring it to grand jury and, and then bring it to, you know, ultimately a court appearance. Most cases do get settled uh, ahead of time, but the, the district, the DA's office is extremely busy. 
Um, the position, you know, the DA himself is based in Caribou, but there's a DA's office in Presque Isle and there's a DA office in Holton and they're all swamped. Um, I think about 35 or 4,000 cases a year are held through or go, go through the DA's office. Uh, you know, a lot of times D defense attorneys hold out right until the very last second before you're going to trial and they'll settle because they don't want to go to trial and they're hoping for a more lenient uh, arrangement. Um, but um, it is a very busy office. Um, the only crime that would be committed that the DA would not handle would be a murder trial. Uh, murders in the state of Maine are handled exclusively by the attorney general's office. Probate court. Um, I think we've all heard about probate court, but a lot of people don't even realize it's part of county government, but um, they're busy with a lot of um, people want to change their names all the time. And uh, you'd think that doesn't happen up here as much as off as it would elsewhere, but it actually does. So there's a lot of name changes, um, but anything else like adoptions, guardianships, um, conservatorships, um, and then estates and trusts, if a person passes away and they have no family and they never had a will, um, the probate court has to step in and make decisions on what that person, where that person's estate is going to go. Um, and it's not up to the probate court themselves. The law requires the probate court to have what's called a public administrator. Uh, currently is Frank Bemis. That's a position appointed by the governor. Uh, Frank is an attorney in Presque Isle, but basically if someone is indigent or doesn't have family, Frank would step in and serve as the representative representing that person. And so that person, even after they're deceased, has a voice at the table as to where their assets are going to go and how their assets are going to be distributed. Um, and then a lot, of, um, a lot of times people, if they get divorced and there's child um, protection or uh, child um, Oh, not child welfare, but uh, child support. And a person chooses not to pay uh, for whatever reason, the probate court steps in and, and enforces that support through a court order. And then that court order gets filed ultimately with the person's employer and the employer is mandated to withhold payment from a person's paycheck um, to satisfy the child support. Uh, <clears throat> and... Most of this stuff, probate court and registry, a lot of the records are online. So you can actually go do a lot of searching right online now. Uh, probate court does have some things that are uh, protected, you know, are classified and those wouldn't be available, adoptions especially. Um, but most, most documents are now a public record. Registry of deeds, um, like I said, we're the only one that has two registrars, one for the north, one for the south. And anything and everything you can think of is recorded there. I think most people think of the deeds themselves. Like, so if you sell a property, your deed will get recorded there. But um, divorce decrees get recorded at the registry. Survey plans get recorded at the registry. Um, so there's a lot of other valuable documents that people want to retain forever. And those get recorded at the registry of deeds. They're not only recorded there. Another copy is actually recorded in the archives in Augusta. And then, of course, now everything is online. In our case, everything is online from 1960 forward because that satisfied at the time the number of years they had to go back to clear title for title searches. But that, what I mentioned earlier, that assistant deed position that we're bringing online next year in Fort Kent, that person is going to be dedicated to archiving and putting online records from 1960 back. Um, Holton has been able to do that because they have that third person in the office and they've been able to do some of that. They're still not back to the beginning of the county, which was 1839, but they're back at least 20 or 30 more years. So it's amazing the amount of people that go and use the registry for genealogy research, looking at their grandparents and great grandparents and who owned the land in 1900 and who it was sold to and a lot of that type of uh, research is done. Uh, back to the sheriff's office, uh, like we mentioned, the different divisions. These are the number of folks that work in there. And also, uh, you can see, like, our deputies responded to over 7,000 calls last year. And that covers 45 towns, nine plantations, um, the, and all of the unorganized townships. 
Um, in the corrections division, we have the jail. Um, we, we have, we can, we're licensed up to 120 inmates. I can tell you that most of the time, there are 120 people incarcerated in Arista County Jail. We're down right now to about 100. I don't know if you've heard, but we have a major COVID outbreak at the jail right now. Um, it's gotten really bad. There's uh, 60 inmates and a third of our workers have COVID. Um, so the jail right now is closed, completely closed. Um, and what closed means is the people that can still work there are working there and the inmates that are incarcerated are still incarcerated there unless they're so sick they have to go to the hospital. Um, but what it means is if someone commits a real violent crime in this county right now, we can't house them. So the state police and the local police departments were all notified today that if something really bad happens right now, they have to bring that prisoner to uh, a Southern Maine jail, which puts a real strain on the local police departments, which are already struggling with, you know, staffing issues themselves. So this has really got to, we have to get behind this, uh, behind this situation real soon. Uh, and then the transport folks, um, that includes the dispatch on this slide, but um, I mentioned that earlier, the, uh, um, moved 2,223 inmates uh, in 2020, and that was 103,000 miles put on our vehicles, just moving people around to, like I said earlier, doctor's appointments, um, court appearances. Even though the jail's in Holton, the, um, most of the jury trials are done in Caribou. Um, that's a preference of the judge. Um, and so we have to move those when they can't do it by Zoom or interactive television, which we do, they do try to do a lot of, but if they ever need to be in person, then those folks have to be brought up to care of that building that's in my backdrop here is, is uh, where they bring them. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, we're also dispatching for the some, three local police departments, two ambulance services, and 15 fire departments. All totaled, our dispatch center handled 18,000 calls last year. We don't answer 911 calls. Um, many people don't realize, but when you dial 911 in Aroostook County, if you're on a cell phone, uh, chances are that that phone that call will be picked up by the Holton Barracks, the state police. If it's a call in a commute coming from a community that we're dispatching, that call will get routed to the dispatch, and they'll take care of the dispatching. If you're calling from a landline in Aroostook County, that 911 call is going to be answered by the Penobscot County RCC. Regional Communication Center in, uh, in Bangor. From there, if it's, a, if it's a call coming in from Fort Kent, that uh, PSAP uh, operator will know that, that that Fort Kent has its own dispatch and that call will go to the dispatch desk at the Fort Kent Police Department. If it's in St. Agat, that information is gonna come up on the screen that says St. Agat is provided dispatching by um, the uh, Sheriff's Office that's where that call will go. So that's all integrated and coordinated behind the scenes. People don't even realize that that's happening. But we have to pay for that, that 911 answering. We pay about $190,000 a year to Penobscot County to answer the 911 calls here in Arista County. <clears throat> uh, facilities and IT, um, you know, oversees all of our, all of our the infrastructure backbone, the the email servers, the wide area network. I mean, I, I'm so out of my comfort zone talking about this stuff because I'm not a tech tech person, but uh, all of that technology stuff that any organization now has to deal with. Um, we do have a contract with a provider, a vendor that helps with all of that uh, because it is way more than one person can handle. And especially one person who's also overseeing all the facilities and building stuff too. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the county has seven buildings that are managed by this department, the Registry of Deeds, the Caribou Courthouse, Emergency, Emergency Management Building, the Sheriff's Office Building in Holton, the Holton Superior Court, the Rustic County Jail, and the Jail Garage. We also own the Sinclair Senior Citizen Center in Sinclair, Maine, uh, but they, uh, the Senior Citizen Center there, the seniors there, they do most of their own maintenance and things, unless it's a big project like a roof or a floor or something like that, then we step in and take care of it. But the janitorial stuff is handled by, this, by this, the senior citizens themselves. <clears throat> and then EMA, um, they work 
a lot with the communities on planning. So federal uh, emergency disasters, uh, when Fort Kent had the major flood, for example, the EMA staff stepped in there and worked with the local folks on coordination, logistics. Um, and this is a year round thing. It's not just when the water level rises and it's springtime. Uh, they're on top of everything from major snowstorms, working with NOAA, working with uh, 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 the, the highway folks, the, you know, the public works people. Um, during COVID now, they've been doing all logistical work. They've worked real closely with all the hospitals, making sure that people are getting their PP, PPE supplies. Um, they have a direct line to the state office of emergency management agency, which is tied right into the CDC. So our director, Darren Woods, meets, I think, on a weekly basis still with all the hospital folks um, trying to coordinate this massive effort in the rest of the county. When the vaccines came out and they were setting up all the, um, all the sites, EMA was providing support there as well. So it's an ongoing, everyday thing uh, for them. And they also, like I said, oversee that North Lakes Fire Department. Um, that happened back in the early 2000s, um, brought that in-house because it is all in the unorganized territories. Um, and there are three fire departments that are merged under one department, Sinclair, Cross Lake, and Madawaska Lake. And the folks that work at the EMA office serve as the fire chief, the deputy chief, and the captain. All the other folks that you know, staff that, those departments when there's calls are local residents in those unorganized townships. Um, that, uh, that are paid on call to respond. So it operates just like any, any of our local rural fire departments that don't have a full-time department or staff. <clears throat> they respond to about 45 to 50 calls per year, and they provide mutual aid to a lot of the communities up in the St. John Valley. An organized territory, um, very separate and distinct. A lot of people think that that's all we do, but it's actually just one little piece of what we do. Um, but unorganized territories does fall under county government. If you can just imagine any local municipal service that you get from your town, we're by law mandated to provide that service to residents that live in the UT. Um, we have about 2,000 people that now live in the unorganized territories from Cary Plantation, Benedicta, all the way up to Van Buren Cove. Um, I'd say Escor, but I don't know if we have any full-time residents anymore in Escor, but certainly there are a lot of camps and uh, homes in those unorganized territories throughout the north, Northwest Woods. Uh, Paul is the only employee that this department has, uh, and like I said, everything's contracted. Uh, he must have, I'm going to guess, probably over 100 different contracts that he manages, either for snow removal, fire protection, road maintenance, um, on and on and on. I mean, it's just amazing. There's 130 miles in Aroostook County that are county roads that are in the unorganized territory. Um, and he has to make sure that those are maintained and plowed all the time. Um, and we accomplish that, like I said, mostly all through contracts, mostly, or we try to have a neighboring municipality that has a public works department also provide the service to us. So um, here in St. Agat, for example, if you leave the Lakeview and you head out um, up Flat Mountain Road and you cut across what's called Daigle Crossroad, at some point you're going to get to the town line there. And from that town line out to Route 161, is it? Yeah. Um, Caribou Road, that's the Willette Road, and that's unorganized. Well, we have to maintain that road year round. So we contract with St. Agatha and we pay them a contract fee for them to just continue plowing all the way out to 161 and turn, turn their plow there where the state picks it up. But in the Cross Lake area and uh, other areas where there isn't a municipality close by and we have a road, we actually put it out to bid and we, uh, we award contracts to private uh, contractors to provide the, the road maintenance. All summer type road maintenance, ditching, uh, culvert replacement, grading, that's under what's called a general service contract. We have one contractor that handles the northern part of the county and one contractor that handles the southern part. But all the smaller contracts and the winter maintenance contracts, those are all done individual basis based on where we can find people to do the work. 
the most difficult one to find is in Oxbow. A few years ago, Oxbow Plantation deorganized, and we inherited that entire seven-mile road that goes in off of Route 11, all the way into into the North Main Woods, where the where the gate is, where the town road ends, or was the town road. Can't find anybody. You know, there's no real close town nearby. Uh, Masardis doesn't want to pick it up. It's too far for them to drive all the way to Oxbow. Um, we had a contractor that lived there. He retired, got somebody else. People complained. I mean, it's just been a nightmare. So um, it's, a, it's a real challenge to find some of these, find people to do some of this work uh, in these remote, more remote areas. And the budget for the UT is very separate and distinct. It's not part of the county budget. So when we're going through our budget process, we're also developing a budget separate for the UT. Same public process, but the difference is when we're done with the UT budget, we have to then submit it to the state and the state combines it with all the other county budgets that, are, that have unorganized territories and they present it to the legislature. It's the taxation committee, the legislature that has to vote and approve that budget. And that budget gets shipped over to main revenue services. And so they roll all that together and they're the ones that commit the taxes and then send out the tax bills to the property owners of the unorganized. So, there's been a long time misconception that county taxes pay for the unorganized territory. It's just the opposite. Unorganized territory pays for its own. And then a portion of the unorganized territory budget pays into the county tax based on their valuation, just like every town does. So that's how that works. Uh, coming up on the horizon, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we have for projects that we're gonna be looking at here. Uh, Jail Study Commission. We kicked it, or we were going to kick this off a year and a half ago uh, in March of 2020, but something took precedence in March of 2020, <laughs> and it really put everything on the back burner when, uh, when COVID hit and we all had to go home, and we just couldn't see ourselves trying to form a, a brand new commission and study the need of a new jail during this time. It's just impossible to try to, even though we all learned how to use Zoom, we didn't know anything about Zoom back in March of 2020. Um, and we really feel that it's important to wait until we can all be back together again so people can actually tour the jail, see what the jail is. Jail was built in the 1850s. It did have a substantial upgrade in the 1980s. So it's going on 45 plus years. And if you've never been in our jail, it's kind of like dormitory style. So you go in there and there are pods where inmates are all housed together, 12 or 15 people in a dorm. Um, it, it's not conducive to today's standards at all. And it requires us to have more employees than we would have to have in a modern jail. Because in the standards of jail care and inmate care has exceeded the life of our jail. So what worked back in even the 1980s is not the standard today. You have to have so many guards for so many inmates that you can actually physically see at any one time. There is a control room that sees everything in the center of the jail, but there has to be an actual person, an actual guard that's able to physically view and inspect the prisoners when they're incarcerated. And new jails are all laid out on one plane so that the eyes of that one guard can see, you know, 25 or 30 people as opposed to 10 or 15 that we can right now. So we have to look at that. Um, what we end up doing with that is either going to be a recommendation of a new jail or a substantial upgrade of the current jail. I'm not sure. Um, but in any, any event, that's something we're going to be working on. Um, the reapportionment has happened. The new commissioner districts have been determined. That was a pretty easy process this year. Um, and so now on, July, on January 1, the new commissioner districts will go into effect. There's not much change. Um, the North still has a district. The Central has a district. But there has been some moving around a little bit uh, just to make the, uh, the commissioner districts equal in population. Uh, we're going to be looking at the charter. The charter hasn't been touched since 1989 when it was adopted, or 87. I can't remember now the date. Um, there are some things there that we want to look at. So we will be looking at a charter commission at some point. And then our county fiscal year goes from January 1 to December 31. And what that causes, because statute requires county taxes to be paid in November, 
it actually requires us to borrow money from bank and anticipation note for you know eight months of our fiscal year to operate until our tax revenue starts coming in late in the fall. So we want to look at changing our fiscal year to coincide with the state fiscal year, July 1 to June 30th, so that that eight month wait time will be cut down to like two or three months uh, and cash flow will be a lot better. So that is what we're looking at in the future. And that concludes my presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. That uh, Aroostook County Charter of 1989, you said Aroostook County was the first county to have one? Yep. What, what happened to, uh, why did they have to come up with that? So the ch before the charter, everything that was pertaining to county government was you had to go into state statute to find what the county could do or couldn't do. Um, there was no county administrator. You know, a county could hire an administrator, but there was no no position in anywhere that said that. It was a county clerk position that was available before where the commissioners made the day-to-day -day decisions. So instead of the commissioners showing up and meeting at, at a meeting and voting on things once a month like they do now, they were literally having to go in and be the <laughs> be the decider of personnel issues, uh, purchasing issues, what have you. Um, so that was one major reason why they adopted the charter. The other thing was the finance committee, wanting to have a more accountable finance committee that oversaw the financial budget preparation. Um, I think that and I'm really speaking from you know things I've picked up in the last several years. I think there was a lot of... Um, I don't want to say mismanagement, but each each elected official basically went out and decided what he or she wanted to spend in their own office without really getting any true oversight or approval. So the charter brought all that into focus. And since Aristic has adopted theirs, there's been about half of the counties now that have adopted these charters, some with more levels of sophistication than our own, um, but we were first out of the gate. You do a lot of tax abatement appeals? We really don't. Um, I'd say maybe on average two a year. And, and so I've been here five years, so maybe we've done 10. And I think we've probably only agreed with the uh, property owner maybe once or twice. Um, so the towns, you know, have a certain set of rules they have to follow. <laughs> And you have to really prove that they really erred on you because what it requires you to do is you say, I'm over assessed. Okay, fine. Find us three properties that are just like yours or very similar to your property and show us that those are not as assessed as high as yours. And nine times out of 10, if your taxes are high, your neighbor's taxes are high too. <laughs> Um, there was there was one that I remember in a town where they 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 did treat the classification of land farmland differently, and I think they were doing that maybe because of a carryover from years back when farmers had more clout on elected boards. Maybe I don't know, and so farmland was being treated differently than other non farmland in the same rural area. And so that was one where we ended up siding with the property owner um, and the town ended up changing the assessing practice there of that. So mm. that's not, that's, that's a horrible position to put anybody in. Yeah. And if, and if, and so the way it works is after we've made our decision, the commissioners have made their decision, an actual formal decision is sent to both parties and then if either one that's not happy with our decision, they can then appeal our decision to superior court under what's called rule 80 K. And then it would be a judge that would hear the, hear the, the case and decide if we made a mistake or, you know, whatever that's never happened since, since I've been here. As you were talking about all of these departments 
all of this work. And there, there's a volume of work here that we don't see at all. I mean, uh, number of 911 calls, just staggering. You know, I, I was trying to figure out the, doing the math, how many per day. That's, that's, that's a lot. How do you manage all of those? Because it's not it's not like managing just one thing. Right. As an administrator, how do you how do you balance this off? It's just well, um, I I think my biggest um, benefit is the fact that the people of Arista County have done a really good job of electing really good department heads. Um, and I can tell you, having been around now a little while, that we are kind of unique. <laughs> um, there have been some really inappropriate um, situations in other counties where the elected person, whether it was the sheriff or in Penobscot County right now dealing with their elected treasurer, um, these people have gone rogue. And that's where problems come about. I mean, Oxford County, not that long ago, this was in the paper. So I'm not like talking out of school here. Oxford County Sheriff was caught sending sexual images of himself to, you know, uh, his deputy and deputy's wife or something. I don't even remember now the whole thing. Uh, the treasurer of Penobscot County right now is under indictment for a child porn, you know, uh, 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 a child porn case. And he's also an elected member of their school board in, in Bangor. So, I mean, you know, yeah. knock on wood, the reason why I'm successful is because the people have sent people that are qualified. You know, the sheriff, the sheriff, the requirements to be sheriff are very minimal in state statute. And our sheriff has almost 30 years of law enforcement experience and he's worked his way up. You know, he started off as a guard in the jail and went to the road and then after working deputy, he got promoted to the drug enforcement agency and he worked there for a number of years before becoming chief deputy under the former sheriff and then ran for the sheriff position in his own right. So, you know, we got people that are really qualified, um, I think. And I couldn't, I cannot sit here today and, and tell you that any of the people that have been elected to these positions, I would not hire myself if it was, you know, a hired position. Um, they're really dedicated folks. Mm. And communication is big, Don. I mean, uh, I don't want to keep picking on the sheriff, but it's probably the most important, not important. I don't want to say important like everybody else, not important, but it's the most visible position. Right. He's dealing with so much all the time and he has to deal with everything. He keeps, keeps me informed. Like we talk, if we don't talk daily, it's kind of like an anomaly. And when I say daily, I mean, there are Sunday afternoons that I'm on the phone with him because something's happened and he feels it's important for me to know um, so that nobody's blindsided or caught off guard. And then I let the commissioners know. So, because oftentimes the news finds out faster than we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially in this age of Facebook, you know, things happen in, I mean, the word spreads like it's instantaneous. Right. Right. <clears throat> and I, you know, I have uh, one of these police radios in my vehicle and I'll tell you guys, sometimes it's pretty sad and scary what happens in this County at all hours of the day. Um, I cannot even tell you how many times I've left St. Agat to drive to Caribou in the morning. And there hasn't been at least one, two, and sometimes three different calls all over the County for domestic violence. Mm. Um, so what is, wow. what, what is somebody fighting about at seven o'clock or seven thirty in the morning? <laughs> you know, I just, I can't figure that out, but it's a serious, serious thing. So anytime you see these programs, you know, the, uh, what used to be the battered women's or I, I can't think of their name now, these important, these programs are important and they're important for a reason because it's here. Um, hope we all justice. know. Yeah. 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 Hope and justice. Um, you know, we talk about the drug epidemic and, you know, growing up when I was growing up, it seemed like that was a problem of somewhere else. And then as I got a little older, we heard about, you know, a bad drug problem in Washington County. Well, that's Washington County's problem. And then even when I got working, professionally working, it had creeped into Holton. Well, that's Southern Aristic's problem. Well, it's now all of our problem. Yeah. Um, it really is from all over. And if you talk to any of your local police departments, they're dealing with it on the daily. 
Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue that we all have to come together and try to figure out a solution at some point. It's, it's consuming everybody. Ryan, I'd like to say that you did a, an excellent job at presenting this. It, it seems like this is not the first time that you've, <laughs> you've presented this. You were very, very, very well prepared. The slides were tremendous. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. A um, little uh, story about this presentation. I, you know, you know that I was a town manager for a long time. I didn't really know what the county did when I got hired. I mean, I knew yeah. some of the stuff. So this PowerPoint, it's changed a little bit over the years, but this PowerPoint was actually me four years ago putting together a PowerPoint to try to teach myself <laughs> what I was supposed to be doing. Yes. And, and I, I use it, um, you know, sometimes civic organizations like Rotary Clubs or Lions mm -hmm. Clubs, they'll ask for a presentation. I'll, I'll do it there. And I've also done it at some of the local towns because towns are usually not very critical of us, but like, obviously we send them a big bill and they want to know why they're, you know, what they're paying that money for. So this helps kind of explain what services the county does provide. At least we hope it does. Well, you did a good job. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Maria. That was an excellent presentation. <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank well, you. Everyone have a good night. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much, Ryan. You really too. Appreciate thank it. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.